two communities that we are partnering with under a regionalization plan are really using 15 hours. Um, and it didn't really make, didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Although, I will say that, um, you know, in light of what the board has in mind in additional activities, it certainly is something that we need to be open with consideration. But it needs really, and this was kind of a consensus of both the committee and uh, I, I don't want to speak for Bob, but for Bob and I in attendance, uh, Ruth Clay is going to coincidentally be attending a, um, a workshop in conjunction with uh, another role she has in Board of Health State in Atlanta. And an adjunct to that is a strategic planning process, which she is going to stay on for, bring back the results of, and that committee is intending to come back with a general plan of why they want to do what they want to do and how they would best do it and what the you know bottom line benefits would be. And you know, I think it was a consensus that we could be going maybe in a totally different direction towards that end. So we'll kind of keep everybody closely as we go and I'll continue to work with them um, when they get started in their strategic plan. Um, I do have a couple of others. Um, one quickly I think probably all of you did receive an invitation to the um, MWRA Advisory Board field trip. Um, I, I felt like since I'm the liaison there, I should probably go, so I accepted and actually have spoken with the executive director about attending and looking forward to um, spending the day next month with him and kind of viewing the facilities and figuring out how it all connects to us. I'll bring you back a report there. Um, lastly, um, the Recreation Committee is extremely busy right now. Um, I was not, they're not busy with meetings, they're busy with activities, which is what's really important. There's a lot of really good things going on. Um, and so their, their meeting is going to be next Tuesday, which I cannot attend, it's kind of the last summer meeting. So instead I visited with, um, with John Pudo to get kind of an update on what's going on. And there are some very exciting things happening. Um, just recently, there was an acquisition made of a 15-passenger van, which will be in service on the road in about a week or so, I'm going to say. Um, and I think it's important to note this because, you know, this is the kind of thing that I'm seeing coming out of the Recreation Department is there's an expenditure there that will create all kinds of program opportunity. They're already, they've already gone off with a group of young people for a canoe trip, you know, with a rented van. These kinds of activities are, you know, I think very important, you know, added activities to what we're doing in the town already. I mean, outside the traditional. And, you know, the van is one of those things that lets us do things like that. Um, another thing that happened that I, I'm not sure how, if you're all aware of it, but, you know, an outdoor um, program person was added. And this person happened to be Coincidentally, um, a CPR instructor, first aid instructor, um, we've been able to utilize this person in training staff. Um, I mean, when you find out how creative I think the recreation department is getting in how they hire, who they hire, and what it's be adding in the way of, you know, kind of two for one things, uh, and so. Part of that, I think, is going to connect back out to something that they're all involved in right now, and that's the um, PAQ study, which is an employee val evaluation to classify jobs and who's doing what. It's kind of, it, it's so in keeping with the philosophy we've talked about together, which is kind of integrating, you know, how to have people do their jobs most effectively and get kind of the most bang for our buck. So that's busy happening. Um, I would say that um, just kind of in front of us is the summer camp programs. Um, last week there was 130 kids participating, banner attendance, tennis, basketball, soccer, track, wrestling, lacrosse, baseball, field hockey, color guard, theater program, wicked cool science, fishing, junior rangers at the McCarra Cabin, um, the canoe trip that I mentioned to you and you know, a hiking trip to the Blue Hills. Offering this, I mean, I don't think, I'm not sure how many of us, at least I was not as aware as I would have liked to have been, of 
all of the things that are going on. And I think it's something we have to really tip our hats to. Um, from a project standpoint, um, I know there's a pre-construction meeting that was going on, that will be going on, I think, tomorrow regarding Washington Park. Um, there's been a, an award of $260,000 and construction is going to go on. The school PF tennis courts are going to turn into one state-of-the-art tennis court, um, which is going to lend itself to, at some time in the future, when the baseball field kind of gets turned and protects the neighbors a little bit more. Uh, but there'll also be a basketball court and the whole walkway entrance around the park is going to be revitalized. Um, Another thing that I think is really important that is going to be happening is going to get done now, finally, uh, it's been a while in the making, is that the lights are going to go on at Memorial Park in the late August, early September time frame. Um, and, and it's a project that's been, you know, trying to find its way now for a while, and it's going to be done, and I'm very, very happy about that. Um, additionally, um, out of the back end of the budget, just in time for the end of the fiscal year. Um, some much needed benches down at Morton Field for the varsity baseball and, and across the way for the uh, varsity softball fields are going to be installed this fall. Uh, they're actually ordered on their way. Uh, more appropriate size, more appropriate location. Those of you that have been down there and watched the game, you know, it's a little bit spooky uh, with those benches. Out. <laughs> so those are going to be moved. So a lot going on there. There's some new fencing that's going to be going on to turf two in collaboration with the athletic department. Why you say we have to have new fencing already? Well, because it was installed improperly. If you put fencing outside the poles and you kick balls and throw, you know, lacrosse balls at it, it bows to the point that it breaks itself. So when it's replaced, we're going to get it replaced correctly you know, on the local business here. So um, I don't want to occupy too much time, but there's a lot going on. The Fall Street Fair is scheduled, and the Recreation Department is very involved in that. It'll be in concert with 5K. And another new item, downtown trick-or-treat this year, uh, the Saturday before, um, um, the Saturday before um, the holidays. So a lot going on there, a lot that we should be proud of. And, you know, I, was, I was very happy to be brought up today on that. I'm sure you guys will be too. So, that's it. That. Subcommittee will be meeting uh, next Tuesday evening at 7 at a place to be designated in the high school. Uh, high school. Uh, we have uh, two candidates for an opening on the historical commission and one candidate for two open spots on conservation. And I just want to let everyone know, and I just want to finish here. We do have other openings. Uh, one associate uh, membership on the Building Board of Appeals, uh, one full membership on the Community Planning and Development Commission, as I said, another position on the Conservation Commission, two positions on the Cultural Council, uh, one position on the Town, which will be appointed by the Town Appointing Committee, uh, one uh, alternate position for MAPC, and one uh, three-year position on the RCTV Board of Directors. Also, the board will be sitting with the remaining school committee to appoint a successor to Hal Croft uh, on the 30th, I believe, of the month. Uh, so we need candidates for that too. Uh, that will be for a term ending at the next local election, uh, April 2015. Thank you. Okay. I have no more questions. Yes, I, um, I just have two. One is um, the zoning advisory committee, and actually I'm just going to say defer that because Jim's going to be giving us a pretty comprehensive update on, on where we stand for that. Um, and then the other one is that there is a situation that's come up at uh, the municipal light department. For myself, um, I'm manager and I sat in on the charter review committee. I collected the inputs uh, that you gave me at our last board uh, selection meeting, as well as all those I received by email. Those are provided in the charter review. It's actually a pretty robust conversation. A number of our uh, 
because he had stated to me that the general manager had no knowledge of the sale until it had taken place. Well, that surprised me, and I looked at the policy, and it really, there was no requirement within the policy for the general manager to approve the sale, for the board to approve the sale, which seemed like a material weakness to me in the policy in itself. I mentioned to him that I was surprised to see that employees were allowed to bid, because that is not the case for the town. It just doesn't see, seem appropriate. I don't care what the employee pays for it, you can never convince anybody that that was a fair and equitable process if it's being sold to a town employee, so, or a municipal employee. So those are the things I shared with him. He said, I'm getting the information for you, we will have it soon. I asked them to forward it and direct it through me so that I could see the information as well, and it will be coming. So I was like, okay, but just in the future, I think this delay seems you know, excessive, and I really, you know, I'm approaching a very busy time of year for me, and now I'm going to to review this during my close. You know, and I had two weeks, you know, it was June 18th when I got the letter, I would have gotten it and, and reviewed it before I really kind of approached the busiest times in the year, and this delay that he imposed kind of made it difficult, but I understood he wanted to organize the effort and, and, and see the documentation itself, so I understood. The following day, I did get the back, it was June 27th. I came in here on Saturday, and I quickly reviewed and started testing what I got. The maintenance records, I had copies of all the invoices that are not the pays. I keep them on laser fees, so I immediately started looking at all of the vendors. I know they do maintenance for their trucks, but looking for these trucks and making sure that those repairs appeared on the maintenance records that were supplied. I found the maintenance records to be complete, and I was satisfied that they were reporting things as they happened. But the maintenance records themselves seem to support the letter, and the letter basically stated that the trucks were in service right up to the date they were sold, that they had all been dialectically tested, which I'm not even sure what that means, but it shows in the maintenance records, and I saw the bills for the dialectic testing. They all had stickers, and they, some of them had new tires. And so when I looked at the maintenance records, I pulled the invoices for the tires. The tires were purchased not recently, but in 2012. One truck had gotten four new tires, one had two new tires in 2012, so I'm not sure how old were the tires. So I looked at the bill, the bill gave you the mileage, and then I looked at what the mileage was at the date of sale, and I realized it was only 3,000 miles on the four new tires, and it was 5,000 miles on the two new tires. The tires alone were worth more than the whole sale. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, geez, they were, in my mind, worth more for their parts, right. you know, even at, at the very least. And nothing that was provided to me kind of supported that they did any assessment of that, which I think that, you know, they, their policy says they're following Chapter 30B, and that seems to imply that you need to figure out how much what you're selling is worth, you know, because there's separate rules. If it's under 5,000, you do this. If it's over 5,000, you do this. The policy stated that they used Kelly Blue Book to assess value, but with a bucket truck, you simply can't value a bucket truck on Kelly Blue Book. But because they couldn't do that, they kind of just skipped that step, I guess, because they didn't know what to do. Um, but when I was reviewing invoices, I did find um, an invoice for the purchase of one of the trucks that would have been to replace one of these trucks. And it was $184,000. So that gives you some idea of what kind of value we talk about when we buy them. Now, these trucks were older, but I would imagine they had to have been over $100,000 when they were purchased. We put $80,000 in each one of these trucks from the date of, home, from the date of purchase to the date of sale. You know, just maintaining them, just doing everything that came up with them. So to me, nothing that they provided me supported selling a truck for $200 or $100 or $50. I wasn't, I wasn't convinced. Now, they were older trucks, so I'm convinced that there was probably rust. There was probably needs of repairs that were going to be expensive down the road, which probably led to their decision to dispose of them. But I can't, nothing rose to the level where I feel like they'd only be worth $100, <laughs> especially knowing that these tires were on them. Um, and so I just felt like what they provided to me showed that they really tried to do the Chapter 30B process, but they probably missed a little bit of what you're trying to accomplish when you're doing procurement. You're trying to get the best price for what you're selling, just like when you're trying to purchase, you're trying to get the best price of what you're purchasing. And so they kind of missed that. But I wondered, when they purchased this truck, why didn't they ask for a trade-in value, just to get a baseline value? Because you would never accept less than what you would have gotten trade. And nobody asked that. So I was kind of surprised that that was the issue. So on July 1st, there was a policy um, 
meeting at RMLT that I was invited to by the chairman. Um, and John Arena was kind of the meeting. There were four RMLT board members present, and so I took that opportunity to highlight to them the problems I saw with the policy that I read, that I was unaware of myself until last night. And they were very receptive. Um, they didn't agree with me on all points. They were like, oh, the you reason that I have to be holder, but I felt like they didn't meet their target market either because they ran this ad in the paper for one day, and the only bid they got was an employee who would have known about it without seeing the paper, and that's it. And I suggested maybe they need to expand their horizons when they post something like that. Maybe they need to look at an online option site. Maybe they need to post it in a more widely viewed paper like the Globe or you know, some suggestions of things that I've seen with the town. The other thing I pointed out to them, just as a frame of reference, is I inquired DPW, which I think is a very similar sort of thing. Do you ever, you know, dispose of anything where it was questionable what it might be worth? And um, I was told that we had an F-150 truck that had 60,000 miles with the engine was blown. So they're like, well, it's not even running. What are we gonna get for it? And they got $800 for it. We just sold three bucket trucks for $350. It just seemed egregious no matter how I looked at it. I just couldn't, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And it seems strange to me that the people who are charged with opening these bids and say, can you really sell this for this? You know, it just seemed funny to me that nobody who does this, you know, these people do the procurement for RMLD all the time, so I'm imagining that they would kind of be like, it seems strange for some of this truck that cost over $100,000 brand new that we put $80,000 into for $100 or $200. And then the fact that it's an employee even just adds to the, the perception of it's not being a fair process. So that seems strange to me. Um, since that, the other thing I, I, I have issue with a little bit is that when I did get the package from the commissioner, there was a report in there from Melanson and Heath. So they had given this information that I was waiting on to Melanson and Heath before they gave it to me, which I had no problem with the auditors looking at it because I made the auditors aware of the situation as soon as I got the letter. But why was I forced to wait when they had, you know, they had the information? So I had an opinion from Melanson and Heath saying, well, they seem to comply with their policy, they seem to comply with Chapter 30B, but Here's my recommendations. And they were a lot of the same things I was saying, which was, you know, you need to determine the value. You need to find another another way to assess value that Kelly Google can't be used. You, know, you need to determine when your board needs to get involved in this position. Um, you need to make sure that those non-collusion forms, there's an actual form that needs to be filled out when people bid for items over 5,000. That's actually filled out. We didn't have those at first. So there was a lot of things about it that was like, why did they wait so long to get into the you know, right? and Heath was able to review it. And I think they just kind of wanted an opinion from Melanson and Heath, but I should already have it too, and we could have been looking at it at the same time. So that just, that's just a comment I just wanted to make there. Since that meeting, Colleen has made me aware of some of the progress that they've made on their end. Because they were serious about changing the policy. They, you know, it was clear that the policy wasn't adequate for what was going on. Um, and so they had a freeze on any dispositions until their policies had been vetted. And they hired a firm, I think it was Rubin and Rudman, to do the um, vetting of the policies and see if there was any um, laws that were being um, broken within the policies or um, any political sensitivity that might be within them just to get them to where they really needed to be. And yesterday I got a, a memo from Colleen stating that that firm identified that selling to an employee is a violation of, I think it's chapter 268A, section 20, um, and that the employee could be punished by up to $10,000 fine and five years in prison for, for entering into a contract for benefit with the, with the municipality. And I enclosed in your packets a copy of that law so you could read through. Um, and so they have 30 days when they're notified of breaking that or violating that law. Because it's kind of a conflict of interest sort of law. Once they've been notified that they've broken that or violated that law, they have 30 days to remedy the situation. Um, and so from what I'm understanding from what Colleen has reported to me, the purchase of these trucks is kind of being reversed. This person has approached her and said, I want to return the trucks for the $360 I paid, and an RMLB is not going to reimburse them for any. Um, is also searching those 
um, records to see who else we've sold things to because they're going to get a similar letter because they're in violation of this law as well. Because this practice has been going on for a really long time. So whoever falls within those statute of limitations is probably going to get that same letter saying, you know, I know this was our policy, but it actually violates this section of the law and we need to do something to remedy the situation. So that um, being the case, there was also a highlight of, okay, this is a conflict of interest sort of thing, which is an ethics thing. Um, they weren't in compliance with having their ethics training, and so that's something that Colleen's working to get them up to date with as well. And so that was pretty much where we stood as of today, but I'm still investigating things. I'm still you know, doing some research. I've asked for all of the dispositions that took place this year and all the backups and what I thought kind of confused me, so I need to ask some questions. And there were other things that came up when I was looking at the condition of the trucks. They had brought up a little memo to me telling me what was wrong with the trucks on the day of the sale. And when I was doing my testing of invoices, I found that some of the things that were noted on that description as being wrong with the trucks had been impaired. So I said, you really need to make sure that you're checking that. If, I think probably just an oversight, but just one of those things. I'm like, well, if you're going to say this is what was wrong, these are the things that this person would have had to repair to really, you know, use this truck going forward. Those things should be an accurate listing. And when I see that the last invoice we paid had those repairs on them, then that doesn't really need to be there. So there are several questions I still need to ask of that staff and, um, and to look at those other dispositions to see what else we might have disposed of that might not and also too I wanted to see if there was any things that you wanted me to look at more specifically um, regarding this or anything else that might you know that maybe I haven't covered. Any other questions? I do have a, a question which is that I know the individuals purchase this is alignment and alignment are many, many hours of production and I understand you have to join business. And I'm just wondering if he has enough time to do a side business in addition to working a lot of overtime. Right. I, I don't know for this person, I just know when I signed off on hours, there were some folks um, that worked up 100 hours in a week. So I can't say for this person, but I just know that that's a and it's common thing with the yeah. And so I, I, I would be curious to know how you can work on a side job when you're looking at the hours. That was one of the things that was noted in the letter that I didn't know for sure. It basically said that he had some connection to some electrical contracting company, but I haven't been able to find proof of his connection, but I haven't spoken to him as of yet. I've only kind of spoken to Colleen, the business manager, the RMLT board, and the facilities manager. There's also the materials manager who signed all the titles and bill of sales, which I was surprised that that wasn't something the general manager or the board had to do so. I have to ask some questions there, you know, just just to kind of get a feel for how the whole thing went down and why nobody asked the question. Like, this doesn't seem reasonable. Like to me, I would think somebody would have said this doesn't seem like it makes sense. I will say when I um, found out about this, I did a little bit of research just by googling, yeah, and I was able to narrow in very easily on those particular makers of trucks, those years, that mileage. And I came up with a range of trucks, and the average price was $19,900. Now, the lowest one was $9,900. The highest was $20,000. You know, 20. But certainly more than $19,000. I wasn't able to find a single truck on one that was less than $5,000. So I, I feel like I did a similar basic I did a similar thing review, but not knowing much about the trucks when I, when I did it, I wasn't able to say for sure, well, this is comparable. Because I didn't know what was wrong with the trucks at any point. You know, but it would have been a way to get a value, is what I even pointed out to the board. If you're looking for a truck that's for sale online, similar make, similar year, and you know that your truck has this repair that's going to cost X amount of dollars, you could probably say, this truck doesn't need this repair, and it goes for this, and you back up the cost of the repair, and you can get pretty close to what the value is. Um, I just feel like they were following the policy as step-by-step -step instructions, and if they didn't know what to do with the oh, they didn't think of something I, else. I find it hard, because I looked at the policy as well, and in my mind, it didn't seem like the policy was actually followed, because when you look at it, you have to figure out what the value is, it's a very first step. Mm -hmm. So if there wasn't a value determination, it was just a guess. Yeah. In my mind, it doesn't seem like the policy was actually followed. And well, that's that's my narrowly, that, yeah. that um, 
um, there's a component <coughs> of that policy that talks about things that are specific to the electrical utility industry. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got a vehicle and it's not listed in Clint Kelly Blue Book, then you go to that other one that's mm -hmm. specific to the electric utility industry, and that one says you've got to, you know, you have to do it advertising in, in the industry bulletin, mm -hmm. not in local paper, you know, yeah. advertises in wedding and you know, yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah. Well, and, and if you're going to put it in a newspaper, I thought, well, you got to have it open for more, a uh, bigger window of time to maybe hopefully get somebody to see it. One day, who knows if anybody saw it. I, I, just, I, I have to say, I found it very upsetting that um, we have people who, when I was there, I spent a lot of time talking about service and how the municipal utilities is a big service industry, and I did not feel like um, the individuals involved in this served the community well. I really don't. I don't feel like they could take the resources that belong to the country. Any other clarifying questions? Um, just a point of information. I want to thank you for a very concise and thorough update, such as you know, as far as you've been able to take it up until now. I know there's more you're going to do. But it's interesting, as a point of information, that there is a business, a local business in Ray, that auctions on a monthly basis yeah. these types of vehicles and heavy equipment and has been doing it for many years um, so i just <laughs> point that out that we have a local business that actually does this exact thing mm -hmm. every 30 days and i'm happy to share that information a little bit later yeah that would be good any questions for um, Sharon, another question I have. Are you still waiting for any other deliverables to be requested? No, I mean, they've been pretty prompt about getting things to me since then, as I've requested things. Like I said, I've requested the dispositions that have happened this year. It looked like there wasn't anything else that we actually got anything. You know, they called everything pretty much scrap metal. You know, like, oh, wasn't worth even offering to the town sort of thing. But no back of the town, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of like, oh, I think it was scrap metal. Well, that's why I was kind of surprised. I would think you'd get some. I thought I would think you'd get something for the scrap metal. So what I got seems to suggest that we didn't get anything for it. So I just want to kind of follow up with that and ask some more questions regarding that, and then obviously interview the people involved in it and kind of see how they arrived at this result. You know, like, you know, I, I can't imagine for the dollar amount that was thrown in there that nobody was saying to themselves, hmm. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> You know, especially for what they're, you know, I mean, the tracks probably looked old and maybe they, in their mind, convinced themselves it was okay. But since this has been the environment, I think that they all kind of, you know, they've seen it happen before, so they just assumed it was okay. Plus, it was part of their policy. And so, you know, we sell to employees, but the price is what kind of, even when it made me start going, oh. Well, I mean, in my mind, they tell me, I mean, I understand they say that it they call it policy, but it, when I read through it, I said, I don't. I kept saying I don't totally policy. agree. I see that there's the effort to follow the policy in, on some level, but I, I felt like the assessment of value was kind of completely skipped. Yeah. And you know, and then the idea that when you're following the procurement law, you know that if something comes in for a bid and it's substantially below what you know the item is worth, you can rebid it. And if that's part of the law, you can rebid it. You can go other avenues with it. You can reject that bid because it's just not good enough. And I don't know if they even knew that step or that option was available to them. So those are things I want to know. Is it is did you not know that you could rebid it? Did you not know you could reject it? Because I don't think the policy even gives them that kind of laid out as a guideline of, you know, high bidder, that's what it's worth. And you know. we'll, uh, for the audience, we'll have a, a talk more formal discussion at a later date. Tonight's discussion is more for the board to hear from Sharon's report formally and uh, I will not
discrimination principles of the ADA. And many organizations locally, regionally, nationally work tirelessly to support citizens with disabilities. Those organizations deserve the recognition, respect, and support of their communities for their service. The Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, who hereby proclaim July 26, 2014, as Americans with Disabilities Act Day in the town of Reading, our job, all citizens support the efforts of the Independent Living Center of the North Shore and Cape Band Inc., which is the voice of all persons with disabilities and their family. This proclamation is an acknowledgement of the rights of all persons with disabilities under the ADA and their daily activities, struggles, and triumphs here in the town of Reading. So I have a proclamation here signed by five members of us. Do we have somebody here to see it? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Please, thank you. Who the Board of Selectmen proclaim July 26, 2014 as Americans with Disabilities Act Day in the town of Reading? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Also tonight, we have a series of certificates. Uh, Reading is truly blessed by an active, vibrant, and I think varied citizenry. <laughs> People are willing to take time out of their busy day with families, jobs, and other things to work on something they're passionate about, whether it's Ready Rack or Historical Commission or Conservation or working on our zoning board, or zoning and rules, um, or serving in one of the various elected uh, capacities in town. And we have um, a number of, of uh, proclamations here tonight. I'd like to, uh, I think the easiest way to do this is to Folks are here tonight to receive them. Uh, please come up and uh, accept our thanks and congratulations. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read one of them. Yeah, so uh, the first certificate is uh, awarded to uh, Edward Smethurst in appreciation of service to the town of Reading as a member of the RCTV Board of Directors for six years. Ed, would you like to come forward? My name is Andrew Fotino. So as you can see in that, it basically talks about 
um, what Reading Little League, since we've turned to Reading Little League from Reading Youth Baseball over the last year, a little over a year and a half, um, our numbers have increased in size. Um, we, we've added a ton of new stuff, and um, we've done some enhancements to the fields, the town fields, and we're looking now to possibly make some new enhancements to um, the tennis court field, which I also probably call the high school field. It's right behind the field house. Um, what we're looking, we're proposing is to um, make kind of a major league field, which is at this point in time, it's Little League Park, also known as Hunt Park. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful field. We love it. It's a fun field. The issue is that baseball's improved since we were kids, since I was a kid here growing up. Um, not so much the poor, uh, not, so, I mean, not, even, not so much even the kids, it's, it's the technology. Baseball, bats have improved, balls have improved. So we're losing balls over the fence right and left. You know, these, these kids aren't much bigger than we were, but the technology's getting better and they can't even learn to play a normal outfield um, because the balls are flying over their head. So they're, they're basically standing against the fence and watching them go. You know, um, if you look at our website, we have a home run club, and there's got to be 40 kids in it, you know? <laughs> so, um, which is awesome. I mean, we, we love the fact these kids are enjoying it and, and getting home runs. But again, we, uh, we want to try and teach them the, the true way to, to field the, and play the outfield. Um, we want to let pitchers pitch to, to contact, but they can't because as soon as they contact, if they're a good hitter, it's gone. You know, so they're getting over the fence. So what we're proposing is, um, again, at the high school field, the tennis court field, whatever we want to call it, um, is we'd like to put a fence in uh, roughly 210 feet from home plate, which, would, uh, which is Little League uh, regulation. Um, and um, we'll put a black fence, uh, maximum five feet in height, yellow, bear, uh, yellow protective piece on top, um, foul, uh, foul poles on both corners in the, in the two outfields, uh, warning track on both sides of the fence uh, to maintain um, the grass so nobody has to mow it and whatnot, and keep the fence safe and keep the kids safe. You know, they'll know the fence is coming up. Um, and then possibly um, a manual scoreboard to enhance the, the, the fan activity. You know, the kids, um, I know when I was a kid down at Little League, um, we used to get to put the numbers up there. It was fun. Now the kids are down there and they're running the scoreboard themselves and they're still having a blast, but just not as much fun as actually putting the numbers up there and changing the scores and whatnot. Um, so that's really what we're proposing. Um, we, we are self-funded through fundraising through the town and, um, and, and whatnot. So we'd be paying for all the stuff I've described through Reading Little League. Um, the town has actually um, offered to do the fill-in and the, because uh, the left field um, area does uh, slope off. So we lose that area. So they would bring fill-in, get that all filled for us, out to the 200 and probably about 220, so the fence is in the 210. Um, and the other enhancement we had talked about doing, which the town has already taken care of, is we were going to put a netting up over the tennis courts to protect the tennis players. Um, we have um, extended the backstop to protect the basketball court as well, because as I said, technology is changing, and these foul balls are going just as far as the home runs. So, anyways, that is what we're proposing, um, and with any luck, we can uh, move forward with it. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Certainly. This proposal was made. The version of it was made maybe two years ago. Sure. Um, yep. Um, and at the time, the length of Mm -hmm. But most notably, the, the proposal, the interest in the organization to do them was an all or nothing proposition. You haven't said anything yet, but is your, is your ask tonight to do them all as a, as a set, or would you entertain doing it? If, if the will of the board is to do a fraction of it, would you entertain? We would certainly you would. Them? Our biggest goal is to uh, hopefully get a fence. You know, we really like the fence again. Um, to help train these kids. If we get all of it, a little of it, we'll work with that and we'll work with whoever it takes to eventually maybe get all of it. You know, um, I've been in this town for 46 years. 
and I've seen a lot of improvements, and, and I'm not going anywhere too soon. So uh, I've got three kids in the area, so <laughs> I'm stuck. So uh, yeah, I've got time to work on this, and uh, like I said, yeah, we, uh, we, we'd like to get this little chunk at one time, but if we can't, we'll take what we can get and work with you to, to try and get the rest of it. Mm -hmm. is that you want to, with the cooperation of the town, fill in and level the playing surface that will create a 210 foot fence. In other words, you're going to create a regulation little league field of the fence. Correct. And that's really what you want to do right now. Yep. Part two of that is a manual scoreboard. Kind yeah. Of an old style, change the numbers, kind of kids it's up on yeah. the rail. And like, yeah, because we realize that trying to put an electronic scoreboard is a lot more work than a manual. And it also takes a little bit of the, the, uh, the fun out of it. You know, there's a lot of kids that really enjoy hanging out by the scoreboard um, and doing that stuff. Yeah, so not to confuse this with the last thing that was in front of a different board. I mean, there was a laundry list of items. Sure. It sounds like what you're asking for is kind of a step one, which is to create a little league, a regulation little league park because we now have a regulation Little League that has Correct. the opportunity to participate in the Williams, Williams Court Tournament that's on TV and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So, um, the second question I have mm -hmm. for you is, if I actually have a couple of questions that you share sure. with me. Um, one of them I think I read is that you were interested in putting in a, um, a warning track as well. Of course, it's an important safety item. Sure. Um, is that that's part of this ask? Yes, that, that. that honestly, if we were able to get the fence, I would ask that we could at least do the warning track as one of those things, more for the safety reason. And um, so, you know, I've observed that you guys are doing a lot of your own maintenance. Of course, you realize that when the warning track goes in, it, you know, it, it, is a, it does create a separate level of maintenance. Sure. Um, do I understand that you actually have, as an organization, hired somebody that does some of your landscaping and so forth? What we do is. Um, our coaches and volunteers prep the fields before and after games, which would consist of that warning track as well. Um, and we do have um, Michael Long, who is Renew Landscaping. We've taken him on, uh, I think it started last summer. And he goes down and drags the fields. He maintains the weeds so they stay out of the infield. Um, and he would also rake the, uh, drag that warning track to keep it smooth and bump free. Because you know, that leads me to my last question. Sure. I think what I heard you say is that you're asking us to accept a gift from your organization of all of these improvements to a town field. Is that correct? Exactly. I mean, like I said, this is Reading Little League's a town league. It's it's not owned by me. It's not owned by any of us. You know, um, so we're here for the kids. This is a gift of and the exactly. It's, it's to a gift to Reading to improve the fields or help improve the fields. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the impact of the uh, usage of that uh, field uh, as a result of these improvements on the town between play and that sort of thing? And would that preclude casual use by you know, fathers and sons going out and throwing balls together? Uh, oh, I would, I would love to have fathers and sons use I mean, we, we don't claim it as our own. We would never claim it as our own. Um, there'd be minimal home games um, from the districts if, if um, we had this. Um, there's only, as it is, the district tournament is a four-game pool play, which turns into a sectional game, um, one or two. But most of those are held at a certain field because um, that's where the district administrator is from. He's either Wolverine or, or North Reading. So we might have one to two home games in the district, um, all-star games and whatnot. Um, but other than that, it's all, it mainly would be in-town majors. And occasionally the triple A teams might play up there. Hunt it would be the intent would be that Hunt would become our triple A so the younger kids could build up to the two hundred and ten foot. And you know, you're you're I'm assuming you're gonna be reserved to your point, Dan, I think you're reserving the field to the right department as everybody, oh, yeah. as anybody yep. would. So yep. you know, I don't think uh, that gets uh, in the uh, way of the uh, Yeah, the by no means. Users. Yep. And, and putting that fence up in your opinion, does that inhibit any other use of the field? Um, I can't really speak for the sports because I'm not really sure what else might play there. Sounds like this is like a maximum case. 
then exactly. Yeah, it would you would need to No, and exactly. You, you could still play T-ball there. You could still play every other league there, obviously, except for the 57, the Babe Ruth, and whatnot. Um, but their fields like are bigger. It's a larger playing surface than currently exists. It is. Because I've been reading the material and looking at this next block site. It appears that there's a drop off out there. So I think what actually happens here, Dan, is I think that it seems like to me at least that there's a larger place to play. <coughs> and there would be um, a gate for maintenance with the lawn mowing. That was the one thing I did forget. It'd be, yeah. Is that gate going to be accessible for pedestrians and folks in the water? Um, actually, it probably, it, we, we don't like the one to hunt, so I wouldn't expect that we'd lock this one either. One of the objections made by different members of this uh, sport a few years ago was one of this proposal made a single purpose field. Your comments tonight seem to suggest uh, baseball, softball, traveler baseball, uh, casual pickup. Uh, the other objection from a few years ago was that the fence could prevent impediment to folks trying to traverse the field and get to the tennis courts or trying to. And a proposal was made to either have the means to walk through the outfield fence or have a gap in the fence to allow folks walking mm -hmm. through. Is that part of the plan? Or could it be made part of the plan? Yeah, the gap well, and that was the so other, uh, yeah. instead of the gate, the other thought was to make it overlap yeah. so they can just get the machines in or people can just yeah. traverse right through. Uh, I mean, it's really uh, the town's um, decision whether we put the gate or we just go with the, um, <coughs> the opening. We're not, we just, we're mainly looking to have the fence. Um, the other comment was, at least, maybe I missed the calling, but uh, in, the, in one of the proposals, either this or the prior, there was a, an element of adding nylon fencing by the tennis courts to uh, ward off foul balls. Is that part of the proposal? That is the one I was mentioning. The, the town has already solicited someone, I, be, I believe, huh? Okay. That's, uh, yeah, the town, I think the town's on the recreation. I think that that's in the it's in the capital, it's in the plant for Birch Meadows. Yeah. Which I, I guess I'd also point out, because I just had the opportunity to review what was done about five years ago and, and, and was asked to be, as a liaison on a newly reconstituted group to update the Birch Meadows plan. Um, everything points to the fact that there is no planned usage for any organized sport other than baseball in that space. I mean, so that's kind of been part of the plan for five years, and um, it appears that the interest of the newly constituted committee is similar. Um, and that doesn't preclude kids from going in there and playing. You know, Not one bit. Um, they want to have a little lacrosse stick and a ball, they can do that too. I mean, that, you, know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, but if it's been reserved, then it's reserved. And mm -hmm. it's not, it's kind of open space. That's the way I see it. This really is reserved for the betting right? Just like it does. So, yep, we talk. We, we deal with John Fudo um, at the beginning of every season, and uh, we reserve certain fields. No, I, I would just say um, in general, I think I think this is a, a good idea. Um, I think making it, you know, one hundred percent making the field a little bit safer for the kids and teaching them a little better way to play the, the game is is great. And to um, what John said, it, you know, this has pretty much been used as a baseball field anyway. You know, to, to make it more of a safe field to use would only make sense. So uh, I think it's certainly a good thing. Any other comments on the board before we take a vote? No. I just made right. one comment, John. Talk about it. Talk about it. Just from a practical standpoint, we have a private organization prepared to help us improve, you know, our fields for the greater good of more kids. Um, and there's no strings attached to that gift to improve town property. Um, I, I, to me, it seems unthinkable that we wouldn't proceed. That's just my thought. So I really thank we thank volunteers for their time. Here's an organization willing to give them all their time to put up our hold our dollars.
John can approach DPW on field maintenance <coughs> issues in terms of exactly how to put your fence in. Um, I'm just thinking of issues we've had with other fields where he was not a consultant and he should have been a consultant mm -hmm. just from a maintenance standpoint. Um, I mm -hmm. guess as you do that anyway, it's yep. just to make sure. Yeah, we work uh, very closely with John. Um, no. Yeah. So that that meant that motion would include working with John and and yeah, uh, subject to the DPW as well, and he will bring in DPW work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'll who would the board of selectmen accept for any youth baseball proposal for enhancements to the tennis court field as presented, subject to approval of the recreation director? Second. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We may have all but the 10 minutes, so um, now we're scheduled to get an update from the zoning advisory. Most of you probably know who I am. I'm Jean Delios, um, and I have uh, been involved in zoning for many, many decades, <laughs> uh, specifically in Reading for five years. I'm the uh, assistant town manager for community services, and um, I just want to, before I get into the, uh, the presentation, I want to give you a little bit of background on, on um, kind of how we got here with zoning. Um, we, the Community Planning and Development Commission, uh, a place where I spent a good chunk of my life, um, <laughs> identified some time ago, over a year ago, that um, you know we kept running into issues with reviews at um, CPDs at the Plan Board, and the reviews were often more time-consuming because of process, this ever-elusive process. Um, and the process is defined by the rules. So we kept saying, we're always in a bind with extending the process because the rules say we have to follow this process. So things like site plan review for very small projects, um, even going back more than a few years ago, um, we identified, I really don't think that was the intent of site plan review. The intent of site plan review was to review development sites. So we came up with minor site plan review a couple of years ago, and town meeting agreed with us, and that got passed. So that, that was a kind of a, a stopgap approach to addressing what level of review is the right amount, and where's the Goldilocks um, on reviewing developments, new businesses coming in, whether it's a commercial development or a residential development, where's the right amount of regulation? And so um, we had a lot of discussion about that even after minor site plan review was passed. And we started going more with a lot of staff reviews where we could, especially for things that got modified. So we kind of um, organically came to this place where we said, gee, you know, the zoning bylaw hasn't been updated in a very long time. Um, it's probably time to think about that. And then I'll have to give credit where credit's due. Bob found a little pot of money um, and said, you know, something I've been talking about for a long time since I got here. 
And he said, will this amount of money do? And I said, I'll make it do. <laughs> so, so, um, so we, uh, we surgically introduced the, um, the uh, skills of a uh, zoning consultant, who's not here tonight because we couldn't really afford to uh, pay for him to come tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a small amount. <laughs> So we have been um, very frugal with our use of consultants and the like, and, um, and so the, the Board of Selectmen, almost a year ago, appointed a Zoning Advisory Committee, and um, so that has been the Zoning Advisory Committee, Jesse Wilson, myself, and this very surgically introduced consultant have spent the better part of almost a year meeting on a regular basis to try and tackle this elusive zoning and process associated with zoning so that we can figure out what's the right, right amount of regulation for the town of Reading. And um, so that's sort of the background. And I, I want to especially compliment CPDC for their leadership in saying, you know, um, we need to do this now and we need to um, jump in. And CPDC spent countless hours at their meetings weighing in on many components of this. So if I don't make that clear in the presentation, I want to say that right up front, um, that we did get so much feedback from CPDC, and so I think that has made it an even richer product at this point. So we decided a year ago that our goal was by July 15th, we would have a draft, new draft zoning bylaw. And I'm very pleased to say that on July 15th, which is today, we have a new draft zoning bylaw. Um, it's not entirely finished, so I didn't say it's going to be finished, but it, it is in draft form, and um, much of it is on a project website, which is www.vhp.com slash zoning. So if anyone has trouble going to sleep at night, I suggest you go to that website, and you will have no problem falling asleep. Or go to the town site. Or go to the town go site. Go to the town site and click on zoning update, yes. and you'll get there to also. So. Yes. So I'm going to run through um, a few slides and tell you kind of how we got to where we got to with our draft. And then I'm going to welcome um, any comments or input questions. Um, and then after I get done, it's um, almost as if we planned it this way, but I have to tell you, I, I can't, I'd like to be able to say that, but that wouldn't be the truth. And after our initial um, presentation tonight, I'm going to be extra, extra careful about everything being truthful. Um, so I want to make sure that, uh, you know, that it just so happened that um, Professor Bluestone from the Dukakis Center at Northeastern University was available tonight, and I thought, how perfect. Uh, we're going to talk about zoning, and then we're going to talk about economic development, and he's going to tell, tell us how we did on our test for the uh, self-assessment. And so um, I'm going to do comments, and then he's going to do his presentation, and then I'm going to come back to you because some of the things he's going to talk about are some of the things that we've been working on. So. And without we'll finish further. up in time to watch Koji finish off the All-Star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Okay, so let's get it rolling. So um, for those of you who aren't really that familiar with what zoning is, it really is a regulation, and it's the primary regulation, that we use to uh, basically evaluate development of property. And um, our bylaw was first adopted in 1928. Um, since then, there have been lots and lots of changes, many of them not done with any particular correlation to each other. And uh, in the 90s, I have to say, as I looked at kind of who came up with these things, you know, uh, we did a lot of th fun things with the public forums where we'd have these cartoons and say, who came up with that, you know? And so in the 90s, a lot of things were developed. And I understand why, um, because in the 90s, we had this thing called the real estate boom. And so cities and towns got very nervous. I worked for another community at the time. They got very afraid that the fabric of the community was changing with all of this development in this big bubble. So things like in Reading, what happened was they made really strict bylaws around signs and thought, oh, we have to control this. Um, then they also adopted the African Protection District, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but that's another restriction. And then, um, again, did it in the community I worked in at the time, they changed 
the S10 zoning district, which is I mean, thousands of properties, to S15. So everybody that lives in S10, your house, your, your home, your real estate, only needed to be 10,000 square feet. When they changed it to S15, it had to be 15,000 square feet. So everybody is non-conforming for lot size. And I'll show you a graphic on that and you can really be horrified. But um, that's, those are some of the things we were like, oh my God, we have to do something. So um, obviously all of that clashes very badly with the goals of this community. Um, we don't want to have hurdles. We want to have, again, that right amount of regulation so that you know everybody says, oh, the town looks so great. It does. But we don't want to over-regulate. We want to have the right amount. Um, you know, we heard from applicants. The Board of Selectmen heard from applicants. You people are killing us with your process, the process. Make it better. Um, you know, they weren't the only ones confused. The staff was confused. <laughs> and so I come in very early in the morning, and I'm there for the building inspector, as is Jesse, because sometimes he's having a meltdown over him. He can't pull his hair out trying to figure out the zoning. And he's been at this a very long time, and he's really good. But when staff, applicants, and the public can't even understand what the rules are, we have a problem. Um, so on we went to try and simplify, modernize, and clarify. And uh, Marcy kept saying, we need to put that on every piece of paper. <laughs> every piece of paper we have on this project has to have that in bold letters. And she's right. Um, so out of that simplifying, modernizing, and clarifying, we have improved permitting because people understand what the rules are. Um, again, that initial draft goal by July 15th, we can put a check mark there. And then a final draft for, and I apologize for the abbreviation, I promised I wouldn't do that, and I did. Um, the final draft is for subsequent town meeting. Now, you heard a little bit earlier, we're gonna have a town meeting in September. So, um, so that works out really well because um, that gives us a, a couple of bites of the apple. The first on the medical marijuana, which our moratorium runs out in November. So we can actually be ahead of the game by doing that in September. And then the second is we have all those town meeting members in one room and we can talk about what's going on with the comprehensive update. So that I'm very excited about. Um, the Zoning Advisory Committee, Marcy West, I think if you guys could just wave your hand, uh, was our um, ever diligent chair, and thank you for all your efforts, long nights, and so forth. Um, as was David Traniello, our vice chair, um, and the asterisk means that they were also town meeting members. Um, David Tuttle, our sage zoning uh, <laughs> consult, who was many, many years with CPDC that we're grateful for. Jeff Hansen gave us a lot of excellent time um, making things simple. Thank you. Um, Eric Bergstrom is uh, not with us, but he's a resident who I don't think ever had anything to do with zoning. So he was the good voice of reason that you know, kept us all to what our mission was. And Aaron, as a business owner, the chocolate truffle, the most amazing chocolate truffle, <laughs> um, she gets it as a business owner, and we got to understand her perspective on that, which was really helpful. And then George Kasufas, last but never least, mm -hmm. our um, wise and able uh, design professional, architect, uh, and long-time uh, associate member of the planning commission. Dean, Dean, can I also jump in and yeah. say, and Virginia Adams, our associate oh, member, who yes. is not on any list, yes. but has given us lots of good advice and has been there working with us along the way for most of the process. Yeah, so who cool from, <laughs> I've never seen anyone from the historical commission come to all kinds of meetings on zoning. Um, and we appreciate it, it's been yeah. very helpful. Yeah. And Gene and Jesse have been fabulous. Oh, well. Truly have been fabulous. It's so. been fun for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we thought it was important to boil down a little bit of where we are. So the sections are one through nine. Um, where you see an X mark or a complete, they are posted on the website. Um, definitions, I want to put an X there. We're almost there. Um, we're going to meet in another week or so at a staff and uh, a little working session and button them up. But we're, we're 
at least 95% there. Uh, medical marijuana, we're, we're almost there. The Animal Protection District. And all the others, we're in really good, solid drafts. We've gotten all the uh, iterations back from the consultant. And um, uh, the only one that we probably have to roll our sleeves up on a little bit more is signs, but that's a bear, so um, I'm not too worried about that. But we, uh, we are cooking right along, which is great. Um, the public outreach part of this project, um, in the end, we will end up having, have, we will end up with about a total of 40 public meetings to update our zoning bylaw. Um, the last community that I worked in, in the city of Peabody, we did it in 32, which is not really great because in Peabody it didn't pass. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully those extra eight meetings will drive it across the finish line. But um, the, the, the amount of outreach and the type of outreach, I think, are really worth noting because Anybody could go in the back room and start rewriting regulations, but we did it in an open and transparent way, and I'm really happy about that. Um, the ZAC meetings, um, you know, we well, obviously we have to post them, but all of the meeting minutes, and Jesse did an awesome job of getting all the minutes done and posting them to the website, and all the information was always there, so that worked out really well. Um, the public forums, we had four of them. Two, uh, one of the fall, couple in the winter with the snowstorms and whatnot, and then we just had our last one uh, about a month ago. So what was great about the public forums is the consultant had the technology called Turning Point, for some of you that were there. Um, that was kind of interesting because you could actually get feedback um, with handheld voting devices, and then the information would pop right up on the PowerPoint, and you could see what the consensus was of the people in the room on different questions that we asked at the end. So that helped us a lot. How would you characterize the turnout with the, um, either by headcount or? Yeah, um, so some, a, a couple when we got like 40, 50 people, and then maybe a couple other, maybe closer to 20, 25. Um, what I was really interested in is um, keeping track of town meeting members that came, because as much as we want public input, and that's important, the final decision makers are town meeting. So we worry a lot about how do you get them, how do you attract them, um, and I'd say we've got about maybe 25% participation from town meeting members, which it isn't bad. It's actually pretty good. Um, we also had stakeholder meetings, and so I would say Bob and I went on the rubber chicken circuit. Uh, Marcy joined us, and we went to the um, Rotary and the Lions and the Chamber, and thank you again to the Chamber who's here, uh, Janet Walgroom. They helped us get the word out to the Chamber, and a lot of Chamber people gave us really excellent comments. We did a, um, an event at the Reading Cooperative Bank, uh, an after hours event, and um, it was like a social, and people came from the business community and filled out surveys, and so we got a lot of, a lot of good feedback from them, and that was a nice effort. Um, and then we had a stakeholder breakfast that we got a lot of good comments on. Um, again, the project web website, and then um, my office does a thing we call bi-weekly notes, so every two weeks we do um, updates of what's going on in town, and um, that's about 4,000 email addresses, so um, there's a constant flow of information on what's going on here. Um, and then, of course, RCTV, thank you. Uh, they recorded a lot of the uh, public meetings that we had, especially the public forums. We had press releases and updates to the boards, committees, and commissions. The zoning board came, and we had a joint meeting at CPDC. Um, so we really got a lot of, uh, a lot of feedback, which was great. Um, again, actively engaging town meeting members. We did targeted email blasts and invited them to the public forums and encouraged them to consult the website just so they would be aware of what was coming because it's a lot of information. So what did we look at? Um, definitions, those are the, uh, the really the foundation of, um, of the zoning bylaw. So we looked at those and we were gonna, uh, some graphics were gonna be in, putting even more. Um, those that we saw that were outdated, we updated, but we added so many. And then, um, again, the medical marijuana, that's um, something we have to get done because the, the, the timeline ends in November. November. Yeah. yeah. Just a, a point that came yeah. up during our town council interviews. Uh, they suggested, uh, having worked with other communities on the medical marijuana uh, bylaws, that you not only regulate where the facilities, but also where it can be grown in support of the facility. Yes, yep. 
Do you deal with that also? We are. We, we actually have a very much refined um, table of uses. We split it up for residential and, and commercial industrial, and it breaks it down both of those ways right. in all the categories. So um, yeah, I think we're covered there. Um, and again, just making it modern, making it easier to follow, checklists, flow charts, as opposed to that dense text. And these are just a, a sampling of what we tackled. Um, we got a lot of interest in in-law apartments or accessory apartments. Um, that's going to be um, something which we'll hear a lot of discussion on. Um, site plan review, special permits, uh, planned unit development districts, planned residential districts. These are sort of um, ways to do development that's a little bit different than standard residential. Aquifer protection, signs, non-conforming lots, non-conforming uses, off-street parking, cluster, and landscaping bylaws. Um, so what did we hear when we had all these public meetings? Well, accessory apartments. People really wanted to talk about that. Um, right now, I won't bore you with how it works, but it's very convoluted of how you go about getting an approval for an accessory apartment. Um, so we have to, again, figure out how, mu how much regulation we need in that area. We certainly need to clarify it, and that's that's one thing we will do. Um, the Aquifer Protection District, so other communities aren't as strict as we are with the Aquifer Protection District. Um, and so we're looking at, can we maybe come up with some ways that you can use low impact development? If, if I'm doing something to my house, can I do rain gardens instead of having to put an underground infiltration system in and use more contemporary modern ways to um, deal with the stormwater as opposed to those expensive infiltration systems. So we're looking at that again, trying to figure out the right amount of regulation. Um, okay, do we still have an aquifer to protect? Well, I'm going to go into that for a minute, so hold that <coughs> thought. <laughs> now we get that question a lot. Um, the medical marijuana dispensaries, we met with our CASA and, and um, some other folks in town who were very interested in the police department. Um, and we decided that, you know, obviously we wanted to keep these as far away from where children congregate, which is how it's defined in the state regs, um, near public transportation, but obviously not in hidden corners of the community. And then non-conforming, you know, there's all these quirks about non-conforming, all those houses I told you about that when they changed in the, from 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet, now those people are to buy them because they have a non-conforming lot. So we try to figure out a way to come up with some things that would be less painful. Um, and then permitting process to simplify. We know that's important. So what did we do? Um, so we, we tweaked on the authority and the purpose. We, um, we went back more and, and, and echoed um, the state statute. And we clarified why, you know, what is the authority of zoning? And why is, what is the purpose? The definitions, we went from 60 to 300. That's a lot of definitions, just meaning we added um, that many more and clarified probably at least half of the 60. Um, the, the districts, we realized, wait a minute, we have some districts here that don't make sense. We adopted a smart growth <coughs> district. Why do we have a mixed use district downtown that no one has ever used? So we are deleting and then um, establishing the districts again. Um, uh, you know, we wanted to clarify a couple of things like when a lot is in two districts. So that was a housekeeping item. Um, section four is over 100 pages. So that can't be any fun for anybody to try and read 100 pages of regulation. Um, so we want to overhaul it, break it up, put graphics in. Um, again, CPDC was great. They helped us so much with so much of this. The tables, table of use is important. Um, and the reason why a lot of this matters is that if it's not clear in zoning, if there's no definition, if the use isn't listed in the table of uses, and I always use the example of the dog grooming business, poor dog grooming business wanted to open up on Main Street, South Main Street going towards the Stone Line, and that two dog grooming businesses had to go through a special permit to open. That doesn't make any sense. It's Main Street, it's a dog grooming business. So because we didn't have it defined, and because it wasn't in the table of uses, that those businesses went through an extraordinary process just to open a small business. Now that's not right. So um, that's where a lot of this minutia becomes important. 
Um, again, special permits, we looked at, wait a minute, why are we sending people to Zoning Board of Appeals for some aspect of a special permit and then sending them to CPDC for site plan review? We had one that we learned the hard way, the um, dance studio, the yeah. ballet studio, they were fit to be tied because they went to one board and got one thing, and another board and got another thing, and then they got really mad and wrote a really angry letter, and it was ugly. So let's not do that <laughs> again, hopefully. Um, so people can be good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they cook on their feet, right? So what we decided was, okay, if CPDC is already doing site plan review, how about if we make those special permits go to CPDC and it gets done all at once? It's a one-stop shop, and we can be done. So that's what we're looking at for that. Um, and then the carriage house to Virginia Adams, thank you for helping us make sense of that because so many of the beautiful older homes in this town have these beautiful carriage houses in the back. But the zoning that we wrote for it, nobody could understand. Well, maybe Virginia could, but <laughs> other than her, no one could understand it. So we said, we need to figure out how to do this. So we said, all right, how about if we do it under accessory apartments? And Virginia gave us really good language and guidance on how to do that so we didn't boil down what we needed for the historic preservation piece of that. So we're in good shape with that. Um, again, with working together with the different community people, we did medical marijuana. The Aqua Protection District, um, I've been in touch with some folks at DEP, the consultants weighed in. There are some ways we can get around some of these cumbersome requirements. And then, um, again, site plan review, just making it simpler. Um, uh, again, with the non-conforming, there were all these vague parts of non-conforming that you know we struggle with too that were clarified. Um, so accessory apartments. Um, so this is a self-contained apartment that's part of an owner-occupied single-family property, either in the home or in a detached structure on the lot. Our goal is to make that simpler because there's parts of that that are just too confusing. Um, we know we have aging demographics. We know we have housing demands. Um, this is a good way for families to address housing needs. Um, and it's very important today to buy a house in Reading, you have to be really rich. You can't be someone that just graduated from college. Or you can't be just a regular person with a regular week's pay. You can't buy a house in this town. So how are these people going to have housing? Whether they're young people or older people on fixed incomes or family members that have needs, um, this is a really terrific vehicle, and we've identified it in our housing production plan to do housing that's affordable, that works, that helps people age in place, all the things that I think we want to do. So um, that's really what makes this such an important piece of the zoning, and we really want to work with people who own these homes to do what they want to do. Um, it, it can be done. This is a graphic, all these, um, dots show you that there are 197 single family homes in Reading with accessory apartments. Now who would have thought there are almost 200 of these? How many of them are there legally is another question, but we won't go there for the purposes of this um, presentation. Um, so when we say, um, when we define them, we went through the assessor's records and we said these are homes with a second kitchen. So not everyone is an apartment. It could be some people, have a house with a kitchen down the basement, and that's you know where they do their heavy cooking or whatever. So some portion of them are accessory apartments. So you can see, I think some people like them. Um, so now act for protection. What is this, and why do we have to have it? Can't we just get rid of it? Mm, sorry, we can't get rid of it. Um, this is an overlay district that regulates new construction and additions, and. Our goal was, how can we lessen the burden of having to put these expensive recharge systems in? So, when the town of Reading began using MWRA for drinking water, it generated what's called an interbasin connection permit. That required the DEP to sign off on it. So, DEP required the town to keep its wells as a backup emergency water supply. That's why we're on the hook. So we cannot say, we just don't need those wells anymore. DEP said, oh, yes, you do. So now we have to deal with how to regulate it. Um, and this impervious area threshold is kind of what we're looking at. If your impervious area is either 15% or 2,500 feet, whichever is greater, that's what triggers artificial recharge. 
the way it is currently. So um, what we're trying to look at is if there's another way to look at this and say what counts as the area, the coverage area. So maybe if, um, if you can do a LID treatment, then that backs away from that need of that expense and of using these best management practices. And it all has to do with how, what we're gonna define as what the coverage is. And so that's where we're drafting and looking at. Maybe there's a way to do it. And that's, that's a state requirement on the impervious area threshold? Yes, that comes right out of the state regulations. But what you count as part of that, so if I want to put a driveway in and I'm using <coughs> permeable pavers, right. intuitively you think, okay, well that shouldn't count. The way our definition is, it counts. That's something we should count. That's where we're trying to find that Goldilocks. Mm -hmm. Can we, and, and where we're getting a, lot, a little bit of um, static is if we do that, then who's going to maintain it? If, if I put in crushed stone in my driveway and I say, oh, no, 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 it's not um, pervious, it's not impervious, it's pervious because it's crushed stone, and I, go, I get by and I do my work, and then a year later I pave it because you don't have to pull a permit for that type of thing. So that's kind of what we're struggling with, but we're almost there. This is the Aquifer Protection District. There are 983 developed or developable parcels uh, in the Africa Protection District. This is 12% of parcels in the town of Reading. The Africa Protection District covers 20% of the total land area of the town of Reading. This is huge. So we have to figure this out and get it right. Gee, the aquifer is the actual underground body of water that supplies well fields, correct? Correct. And it's that large and it underlies all those homes, you're saying? Oh, no. No, they, this is the district that, when they did their engineering study of what was affected. The state. No, we, the town did an engineering <coughs> study and said, what is affected by this district? And that's, those are all uh, those, those are people. All those areas well, feed into the feed into it. I understand. I guess the problem I've always had with this is that the relative insult to that aquifer from Reading has been minuscule compared to the insult from North Reading and Wilmington. North Reading is all that industrial development commercial development right. right along the river. Right. That has to be orders of magnitude more in contribution. Does the state take any of that into account in determining how much of the insult we're really providing to that? That's something that's always nagging. Yeah, I don't think that really correlates here. I can add some of that because when you join the MFRA, there's a lot of the meetings that fall down the center. There's two ways out of having the extra district. And I expect we'll get there. Probably both have to happen if there's a slight chance on one. One is the MWA completes the second connection through stone. Right now we only have one connection, so we need an emergency backup for fire. We get stone, we can abandon the wells maybe. If we go through North Reading, I've told the board in the past that North Reading has expressed some interest of buying an MWA water through Reading. They will have an emergency connection to their north, which then is available to Reading. So if we have two additional needs, then we can absolutely go to the petition of the DEP to say, look, relax that consent degree, we're going to abandon those wells, and then the aquifer protection district will almost be moved. But for now, these are the rules that want to be appealed. And again, the, the medical marijuana dispensaries, the main thing was the buffer zone. So um, when we thought about it, we thought, okay, well, the state <coughs> regs say you have to be 500 feet from where children congregate. And so we said, well, let's see what that looks like. I don't know if you can see it that well, but um, we drew circles around um, what fits the criteria of where children congregate. And it looked like, in the end, it was only a very teeny part of the downtown. Some people said, oh, just put it on Main Street, that'd be fine. And even if we did that, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense because it's only a little minuscule piece of that little green triangle. I don't know if you can see it. So it's, um, it's just like, it wouldn't even really make sense to, to do that. It'd be just this area right here. So what we had been thinking about all along was the industrial district would be a much better place for it. And as I said, we met with the police chief and our CASA and they were in agreement. And then um, this would be the only um, thing. And then possibly the temporary library 
now that we have that worked out, it might be another uh, area. So other than that, it would be a, the gray. Yeah. Can you clarify, my, my reading of this subject is, as some communities still enforcing the old housing code, I guess the governor had, um, modified that for a degree of 300 feet, as I understand it, but you're deciding a 500 foot setback. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, as far as I we, we looked at um, the website, um, David Terniello gave us some of the information, and um, what we pulled up was 500 feet. Some communities are, I don't know how to make it stick, but they're claiming 1,000 feet. Well, oh, you can go you more. Can ask for permission for that. Yes. So, so just so you know, we actually looked at the 1,000 feet, and it's not significantly different from this, and so the additional fight is not going to gain us anything. So 500 makes more so sense. So does that spot, so what's there? That's Home Depot. And this is, we had a high MLD yeah. and Home Depot and all that. Yeah. Well, there's Walmart Health Centers there, Stop and Shop, One General Way, uh, PBW. There's an industrial site in there. You know, all of, all of the, uh, like L3 and so forth, behind our MLD. Um, so there, there are opportunities. We have to provide a realistic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or else yeah. the state won't approve the uh, the regulation. Do we I think that that's going to solve that problem. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We think this works. And there's still 35. Yeah. There's licenses or there's one, one, one more. more. Is 35 the common law? Yes. But no more than five per county. Five per county. Yeah. And four of them left. And I don't know when that expires. That may that was going to be for the I think the first year or so. So, so there's a lot of children's congregations. Yes, a lot of children's <laughs> congregations. <laughs> was that? <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually put the legal definition unless you start a school there and then you're going to have a problem. I did some documentation. <laughs> So back to non-conforming laws, like I say, I'm sort of giving you a little more detail on the things that we heard from the public, and that's why I'm spending a little bit of time on this. Um, this is a lot that was conforming at the time it was developed, but because of subsequent zoning changes, was rendered non-conforming. And again, our goal here was, let's try and simplify this. Uh, I told you about the S10 to S15. 80% um, of the properties that's 3,488 out of 4,416 in total in S15 became non-conforming lots. Um, higher, if that number grows if you look at non-conforming structures, so an older house that doesn't have the correct side yard or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, it goes up from there. Um, that's a lot of non-conforming. So the question, Jean, can you just undo the change in does that create different problems? I think it does, yeah. Yeah. Because so one of the things we did agree when we, as a board, talked about this and doing the zoning was that we weren't going to be trying to make significant zoning changes from this. We were really working on making it simplified and streamlined, and that would, that would fall into a significant, yeah. so you would tackle that yeah. separately. Yeah, that's kind of a biggie. So, um, so for additions, you know, bigger alterations, expansions, uh, of those 3,488 3, homes, they have to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals for special permit. So it's a big burden. Do you have um, a map that goes with that? Yeah. Um, so um, one of the board members, I think it was David, said, you know, we have daytime government and we have nighttime government. We, we really thought that was good. So the new draft says, let's make more use of daytime government and less use of nighttime government so that we can get people to do what they want to do in their house without undue aggravation. So this is the map that shows you all those non-conforming lots in S15. We don't fall for their own. By how much do you estimate you'll be reducing that number by changes so we're not going to try and fix that what we're going to try and do is um, allow for more staff review so if you have a non-conforming house and you have a uh, I don't know a, a deck that you're going to modify 
if you're still meeting all the setbacks, you're not performing a lot, but you, your deck needs to be renovated and you want to put <coughs> tracks on your deck. And you go to the building inspector and you say, I'm just, the wood deck isn't holding up, I want to put the nice composite. The building inspector should be able to say, okay, you meet the setbacks, you're not any worse than you were before you put that composite deck on, it's no big deal. Daytime government can give you that permit and you don't have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. That's where we're driving to. So making it simpler <laughs> for the simple, smaller projects to have staff review them. It's not encroaching on any set side yard setbacks. It's not worsening the nonconformity. You're just changing something. So we don't want to penalize people. What if the only nonconformity is the lot size? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you indicated a non-conforming structure. I meant to say lot size. Uh, this, this is all what I'm saying, non-conforming for lot size. Sorry. Yeah, lot. These are all non-conforming lots. So non-conforming lots by itself will not cause a non-conformance. Right. Unless, unless you're going to put on a big addition, that's a different story. But like something small, we think on a non-conforming lot, we, staff should be able to review that. So essentially what this is, the things that would go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and they would rubber stamp it anyway, anyway. we're not going to have to even go there because why not rubber stamp it at Town Hall? It doesn't make any sense. It's just adding it. So I understand. To, to, to my simple thinking, you know, it was my first thoughts were, why would you do this in the first place? And then second of all, you know, why, if you want to make future development be restricted to 15,000 square feet or more, why didn't you just do that with a cutoff date or, or whatever else? Uh, understanding that I do not understand how these, you know, are crafted, yeah. but... Um, it had to get passed by town meeting. Two-thirds majority. It's 1985. A yeah. It's a very strict standard. So, a simple question. If the lot size is over 15,000, then they're not covered colored in here, is that right? Correct. So there's a lot of them that are under 15,000. Yeah. Gee, this isn't going to be something that's, um, that's subject to somebody's um, personal opinion, though. It's going to be no. very structured with how they yes. can approach this, correct? Yes. Okay. How can we draw the line and say everything below this line gets dealt with by daytime government <clears throat> and everything above by nighttime government? Okay. That's the yeah. line that we're trying to figure out. <laughs> they have less time. <laughs> they have a lot less time. <laughs> they have a lot less time. <laughs> so this just is another map of um, business A and business B where um, we have these residential homes. These districts don't allow residential. So they're non-conforming lots. There's, you know, not a lot of them. 36 in business A and B. So um, again, these are these are the older homes, mostly like in the downtown area. That if they want to put a deck on, it's a non-conforming lot, and they have a little worker's cottage. They have to go to the zoning board of appeals. So again, we're trying to fix that as well. <coughs> so in conclusion. Simplified, modernized, and clarified zoning bylaw makes it zoning user friendly and easy to administer. Two things I think that'd be very good for the town. Um, streamlining improves the permitting process. Um, plain language and common sense will replace confusing and complicated formulas and requirements. Um, the new zoning, zoning bylaw will tell you what is allowed and what is not in a clear way. What a concept. Um, and we can actually transform zoning into a customer service tool so that anybody who's new to it can open it up and say, oh, wow, this isn't so bad. Gene, one of the earlier comments you made was there were 300 definitions starting from 60. Is there, maybe this is a silly question, is there any provision to allow for the continued addition of things like definitions that are incidental to the core language without having to re reconstruct this group to um, it can form itself over time to a degree. To 
accommodate for any oversight or something. Make it more easily amendable by town meeting and understand. One of the things that we did to make it easier is our definitions were um, lettered, so A, B, C, D. So anytime you have to come up with a new definition, there was a problem with, you know, how do you do that? How do you insert something? You can't or, right? Yeah, you can't re letter. So we'd have to fudge and re letter the one above it and put it in. So we stripped out all of that. So new definitions can easily be added because it's just alphabetical, mm -hmm. simple. Um, as new things come up, we have, CPTC has um, <coughs> looked at things and said, oh, we have to do something with the definition, not just we have to do something with the body of the zoning, but we also have to put a definition of this new thing that's come up. So um, I think CPDC really um, shepherds that along at, on a regular basis. This was such a huge overhaul, um, but I think going forward, um, you know, with CPDC regularly taking a look at it, I think we should be in good shape. Chief, I'm sorry. There's no means to tweak this or modestly clarify for that time meeting vote. Absolutely. Right. And it has to go through CPDC okay. in the form of a public hearing. Right. There's no other way of getting it. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yep. So to, to that end, given that the last time we reviewed this, Amelia Earhart was trying to get across the land. <laughs> <laughs> Was, did, the, did the group talk at all about a periodic review cycle so that some of these changes can be made in a pragmatic way, as opposed to having to come and tackle all of this over and over again? You know, is it is it a mandatory two-year review cycle, or it's a good point. was there any? I think we're so focused on getting this done, but I, I think that's. Yeah, and, and th I can't thank you all enough, because you, you know, the economic development conversation is very interesting to me personally. You can't do it right unless you do this right. So kudos to all of you for an incredible amount of work. I mean, anybody who stuck their nose in this stuff, it's mind numbing. So really, thank you to everybody. But but I think maybe you should consider some sort of a regular review, even if it's cursory. Yep. <clears throat> uh, to answer that question, I think we're not there yet because we have a longer list of things that we feel are a little too big to handle. Yeah. So some things that we have been discussing that might take a little bit more time to fix, correct, you know, more, uh, simplify, modernize. We are keeping that list for the, you know, the post-mortem of ZAC, of ZAC, to something else through CPDC that is going to tackle these issues. And once we're done with <coughs> town meeting or with updates, then I think we will be ready you know, to have, to be, to going to be cycles. Yeah, it, I, I, think, I think you can't tackle, I mean, just the non-conforming is mind-numbing in and of itself. I think the discipline of knowing that you have a, a set schedule for review will potentially help the, the group not only set the agenda for what do you want to tackle first, but create a rolling schedule for you to actually be able to get through some of these things, you know, within a decade. Realistically, well, the it, it's a wonderful idea. I mean, we actually we have um, a rolling schedule for review. It's called annual town meeting and subsequent town meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dead serious because those are the opportunities that we have to consider changes to the, to the, the law, whether it's a, a simple fix up or uh, something new comes along, like the medical marijuana. Uh, reacting to the external changes. Yeah, I, I think and, my and we the we do a continuous review of what's there. You know, we know what causes trouble because it shows up in nighttime government. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I also think that there's a, and if we just look at the historic record, the reality is sometimes what that results in is a lot of pieces being added on um, because they're viewed as an isolated incident. And what I'm suggesting is some consideration, and I, and I don't know if it's easy or not, but some consideration where there's an abbreviated version of the laborious task you just went through to say, do all the dots still connect? Because you're right, you can only change, you can change anytime there's a town meeting. But if you don't have a group that is looking comprehensively at it, you know, when we wind up, Amelia winds up going to the moon instead of across the Atlantic, you know, we won't, we won't, we'll be in the same situation. Yeah. So that, that's what I'm trying to think about how the committee might avoid. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And feel free to go to the website if you want to get more details, especially in the coming weeks as we finalize. is amazing. Um, I've um, had an opportunity uh, to be in about 60, now almost 70 communities throughout Massachusetts as a result of the work we've been doing on the economic development assessment tool. And I have to tell you, in all of those meetings, I have never seen a community go through the process we just went through uh, with such seriousness and such concern. Uh, so I feel I'm totally superfluous. We all start How did you make it in at 39 in the last inning? But, so what I'm going to do is go pretty quickly through a lot of slides and um, give you an idea. First of all, starting by just taking a look at the economy. I work very closely with the governor chapter. I work very closely with the legislature. One of our staff, Captain Clayton Matthews is on the Council of Economic Advisors to the Governor. And so I thought I'd just give you a few pictures of what's happened here. One of the beauties is that when I first arrived in Massachusetts in 1971 from the Great Midwest, I grew up in the fabulous city of Detroit, Michigan. Um, at a time, by the way, Detroit was the richest city yeah. in the United States, uh, the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan, where we all went. Uh, was able to pay my tuition in the fall of 1964 based on one day's work at a Ford plant where I was building carburetors for the first Mustangs. When I come here in 1971 thinking I'm coming to the great city on the hill, I began my career at Boston College. And I came to a city and a state that was flat broke, that was going in the wrong direction. Our unemployment rate was much higher than that of the nation. This is the 1970s. High crime rates in the city, uh, you know, very high poverty rates, and that was true in the city and in some of the suburbs. Of course, over the last decade or so, we have been outperforming the rest of the country. And here, if you look at the blue bars, that gives you what we call gross state product for the state or gross domestic product for the nation. And you'll see in almost every quarter, beginning in 2011, is coming out of the Great Recession, we did better, we're in blue, than the United States. And we projected when we get the final results for the first two quarters of this year, January through March, April through last month, that we will have grown the economy at a rate of almost 5%, which is more than twice the rate that the rest of the nation is growing. We can also see what that means in terms of unemployment. Let's go to the next slide. So here was our employment. And you can see what the Great Recession did here in Massachusetts. We had a recession back in 2002-2003, some of you may remember that. And then we had a nice steady growth of the economy where we got up to about 3.3 .3 million jobs. And then we got slammed by the recession, as did the rest of the country. And you can see in this one chart how much trouble that great recession caused. But by the beginning of 2000, the middle of 2009, we started rebuilding the economy. And then fascinating thing is, 
just at the end of last year, for the first time we covered all of the jobs we lost in the recession. And by June of this year, we now have the highest employment level in the history of the Commonwealth. That's very different than other parts of the country. So let's see what ready looks like. Um, fortunately, our Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor, keeps track of the number of establishments and the total of employment as well as the payroll in every city and town, all 351 towns and cities. Very few states do that. And we do that based on the so-called ES-202 forms, which businesses have to file with their unemployment insurance tax. And so I, just the couple weeks ago, took a look at the data for Reading. And I looked at three years, 2001, just before the previous recession, 2007, just as the recession is getting underway, and then the latest annual day we have, which is just been reported for last year. And you'll see, actually, between 2001 and 2007, there was a slight decline in the number of establishments, number of firms in Reading, from about 600 to about 570. And slowly, not very quickly, we started to see a few more establishments opening up here, more opening than closing. If we look at it in terms of employment, you'll see that within the town of Reading, within the town of Reading, in 2001, there were just a little over 7,300 paid employees working in firms or in the public sector. And it fell by almost 1,300 jobs between 01 and 07. Then we hit the recession, and then we keep coming back. And as of the end of last year, we have finally gotten back to a point where we actually have more jobs than we had in 2001. So Reading is coming back. So is much of the rest of the state. Well, where was the big change in Reading? So I'm able to break it down, again, thanks to ES-202 records, to look at which industry sectors were so common. So if you look at change in employment uh, between 2001 and 2013, a period of time we saw the dip and then we come back, how did that occur? Well, overall we added about 182 jobs. But we added almost 1,100 jobs in retail trade, according to these data. Right? So big growth in retail trade, big growth in accommodations and services, and things like restaurants, about 600 jobs there, another 270 jobs or so in healthcare. But on the other hand, we lost jobs in construction, about 100 jobs in manufacturing, administrative services, and uh, uh, we even lost some professional services, about 600 jobs. So you see that kind of change. Okay. So what I want to do quickly is to say, why is this important? What does this all mean? So let's take a look at uh, some of the things that are important. We've learned over the last 10 years from a lot of work at the uh, Dukakis Center, working with groups like the National Association of Industrial and Office Properties, NIA, trade association, that includes a lot of location and site specialists, uh, how important local government and local economies are to actually developing their own economic development. Often we think the federal government does that through its so-called fiscal policy, tax and expenditure policy, or what the Federal Reserve Bank does through monetary policy moving interest rates. Or we say, well, we have state economic development programs, and the state has more than most. It turns out, when you really talk about talk to the people who do site location, what happens at the local level is really what matters. State economic development is based on what happens in 300 and therefore, municipal officials who might have been elected or selected for any kind of, all kinds of reasons, have to play an important and meaningful role in economic development. And why? Slide. One, we're not going to get much assistance from the federal government over the next one. We're running a $17 trillion debt already. We have a Congress that is cutting back on many programs. Some of them would be devastating to our state particularly having to do with research and development funds. Um, and at the same time, there are calls for tax cuts. At um, the state level, next slide, we face structural deficits. I happen to be on the kitchen cabinet of Secretary Glenn Shore, the Secretary for Administration and Finance. We've been looking out, and as you might imagine, same thing true at the town level, the rising cost of health care insurance, the rising cost of pensions, going to make it very difficult to have much more local aid available over time. Of course, there's a 
it's a battle all the time in the legislature whether to increase local aid or not. So in this new environment, local communities are more than ever on their own in terms of their economic development. And the question is, what can you do to attract the kind of businesses you want that are compatible with rate that will not only provide jobs, but in the future, particularly with an aging household, provide some of the tax revenue we need to maintain the services you want. So what we've said in all of this is municipal leaders, town meeting folks, you want, all of you, have to become kind of the CEO for economic development, something which we sometimes don't think about. What does that mean? Got to initiate and support the development process. I heard a lot about that already today. And one of the ways to do that is to do exactly what we try to do here. Begin by assessing your strengths and your weaknesses in terms of business development. Then what you want to do is change what you have control over. You have a wonderful start here. And collaborate with others, particularly others in the region, to influence others, including state policy that might help you. Our, our fundamental proposition behind all of work is exactly here. Cities and towns have the ability to create their own destiny. And they can benefit from having sophisticated partners that's us. We can help them develop tools and information that can be successful. So how did we go about this process that you went through? Well, back in 2004, 2005, we had a group of focus groups who brought together location specialists whose own job, they, their day job, is to help firms decide where to locate. And we sat down with about 30 of them over a period of about six months and asked them what matters. We even ask them, what doesn't matter? When you're looking on behalf of a firm to locate a retail establishment, a manufacturing establishment, a service, you name it, what do you look for? What turns you on and what turns you off? What they call, what are the deal breakers and what are the deal makers? We followed that up with a survey of over 230 location specialists throughout the nation who are members of two professional associations that I approve, and a group called Cornet, which is made up of location specialists who are employed by firms themselves. So for example, my son graduated with honors this year from Northwestern, not Northeastern University. That's kind of Northeastern plus about a quarter of a million extra dollars. He's <laughs> <laughs> a superstar soccer player. Um, he played for the Bulls, he played all over the nation, played a couple games in England, and one of the other fathers of one of the other kids was actually the vice president for site selection for the Genocide Corporation. It's one of the largest, you know, Sanofi, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And um, he was up in the air all the time, going around the world trying to figure out what's the best location for the next, next testing lab, <coughs> the next production facility, or what have you. So we learned a lot from them. It's like, and what we heard over and over again is what these folks do. This is their job, is we try and find out what are the deal breakers. What is it about a community that's just going to make this incompatible with this firm that wants to locate? And what we try to do is ask the question, if there are a lot of deal breakers, is there a way through our assessment, which you've gone through, about 100 other communities nationwide, about 65 here in Massachusetts, to do an assessment, take some action as you're talking about your on streamlining your zoning process, your permit process, to turn those deal breakers into deal makers. And so what are some of the deal breakers? One that we heard over and over again was ignorance of the changing market. What we heard over and over again was in the new global economy, time to market is everything. That is, if you want to make a profit, you've got to get into the market, you've got to get up and running quickly, because if you're a little bit late, you're out of business. And, and the example I always love to use is I have an iPhone. Okay? I used to have a Blackberry. Does anybody have a Blackberry? Okay. Yeah? Well, the fact is, is Blackberry led the world in smartphones. But they were very slow at adapting to touch screen. Apple was very good at it. Now Samsung is challenging Apple. Galaxy 5 and all that. But if you notice, these guys come out with a new one of these every six months. I have an old one. This is, I think, a four. It's got to be at least 
eight months old. So <laughs> the question is, how do you get up and running in this super fast economy time market? The second, which is really important, and we learn more and more about this, is that these site specialists and companies carry around what we heard were cognitive maps about communities. I'll give you a good example. How many of you have ever visited my hometown of Detroit, Michigan? Okay, so we have a few. How many of the room have some idea of what Detroit is like today? Most of you. And you have an image that's probably not real pleasant. But it turns out there are actually some very nice parts of Detroit. And there's some very good things about Detroit, including the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> but the problem is, is that we often have cognitive maps that are out of date, but that's the latest information these folks have. Now, the cognitive map about Reading is a very good one. This is one of my favorite towns. I've been here three or four times now. I love this place. And I love it even more after being here this evening. But think about a Lawrence, which, by the way, is doing very well at attracting jobs now, because they're changing people's cognitive maps about what Lawrence is. Or, or Chelsea, which is also doing very well. So cognitive maps are really important. The other thing that I learned is how much, you know, how little those cognitive maps are based on. I'll give you an example from Northeastern. Northeastern has moved up very rapidly in the rankings. None of us can get our kids in there anymore. It's so competitive. Last year, we had more kids apply to Northeastern University than any other private university in the nation and the third most of all universities, including public universities. 49,860 kids applied for one of 2,800 freshman slots. Okay. But here's a technical problem. How do you evaluate nearly 50,000 kids who have spent hours? Some of you have had kids who have gone through that process. Take the SATs, write essays, get letters of recommendation, right? You put that all together, it takes hours, days, and you pull your hair out if you're a parent, right? So how long does it take to review one of those applications? So I went to the Senior Vice President for Enrollment Management at our school, Philly Minnesota, and I said, Philly, tell me, how do you do this? She said, well, we hire a lot of temps every year, and often do the same temps, and we have them do the first screening, and their <laughs> only job is to either put it into a to-be-continued pile or the discard pile. And they go through the whole application. I said, but what's the average time a temp takes to make that decision about whether you get rejected from Northeastern? The answer is less than six minutes. Okay? So think about a kid who's applying, working that hard. They've got six minutes to impress that temp. What's in the first paragraph of your essay, along with your SATs and your class ranks? turns out to be critical, because nobody gets to the second paragraph. So if you're going to write an essay, make sure, tell your kids, your grandkids, right? That first paragraph is <laughs> really <laughs> The other problem is, is that we have a lot of older cities, of course, where we have a lot of sites that are in site deficiencies, brownfield sites, setback problems, and so forth. Too little attention often to those communities that fix those. Lawrence has done a very good job of rebuilding some of their old mills, and they're showing it up in their establishment data. Out of the 20 poorest communities in the country, in the state, poor cities in the state, Lawrence had the largest number of new jobs over the last 11 years, 12 years. And slow municipal processes, which we've been talking about, are critical. And often, communities just throw money at firms trying to come, get them to come. And what our location specialist said is, they laughed at us. They said, of course, we'll always ask for it at the end of the process for some kind of tax giving. But if you don't satisfy us in other ways, we never even get to that decision. So we got, finally, out of all of that information, created a survey instrument that includes stuff on permitting processes, on the labor force, development and operating costs, the business environment, transportation access, the quality of life, and the social environment. And our final assessment tool that you went through includes 10 different areas from access to customers, highway access, airport access, concentration of businesses, how many businesses are in a certain field, like the uh, hospital sector in, in 
Boston and Northeastern, cost of land, labor, municipal process, and so forth. Next slide. Okay. So what were the results for Reddit? Okay. So we first of all went through, you may remember our big report has all this color coding because we compare Reddit to all the competitors because you're up against other communities for these firms. And to make it easy, we color coded it. So if you're doing better than other uh, communities, you get a green mark. And if you're doing average, you get yellow. And if you're not doing so hot, you get, get red. And then we also said, based on what we learned from those site specialists, how important is that factor? And we use something that I love to call the moon system. So if you saw the beautiful super moon, mm -hmm. just because I was down in Truro where it was just gorgeous on the cake, bright orange, like pumpkin <coughs> orange. A full moon means this is real important. Essentially, don't mess with this one. Fix this one. Half moon, somewhat important. Empty moon, in. not that important. And in fact, I have been with mayors of some pretty successful cities who have flipped through the report. You saw the 40 pages or so. And all of a sudden, their face glows, and they say, wow, we're green. <laughs> and I say, unfortunately, no one gives a damn. How about that one? <laughs> you got a whole mess of rats, and you got to fix it. Okay? So that's good. We went through, and again, this is just a comparison with other communities. But what, what, what is the distribution of the other communities? Distribution in terms of size, in terms of where they are. Where are they? Uh, size they're comparable about, to Reading? Or they're what? about 60 or 65 now in Massachusetts. There are another 20 in New England, and there are another 10 or so around the country. They are some small towns and cities with less than 20,000 people, and I think the largest is Worcester. You know, oh, that's pretty low. We've done Cambridge, we've done Newton. It, as we develop this group, <coughs> we're actually going to be able to compare writing to other communities along a number of dimensions. We're working on new software. So we'd be able to say, okay, only communities that have plus or minus 5,000 uh, citizens, relative viewers, or only communities that are in the you know, eastern part of the state. But for the first cut. Okay, first so cut. currently this report is based on all of them. All of them. Right. And they're from very wealthy communities like Newton and Cambridge, where I live, to some very poor communities like Lawrence and Holyoke, Brockton, New Bedford, and so forth. Okay. Um, so, how do we access? You do pretty well. I was amazed because you saw me come in here. Normally, when I come up from the city during rush hour, it takes me some time. I was here in 22 minutes from my office, which is on Huntington Avenue in Boston. <laughs> and I never broke the speed limit, right? There was no, but you're, you're close to some major highways. That's a great asset. Traffic, comparable, uh, but you have used traffic engineers, which helps deal with that problem. You have infrastructure, you have capacity for growth, even though empirically your aquifer is the wrong guy. <laughs> your rents, uh, you have a lot of good class A and class B uh, properties that are useful. You have a very good workforce, as you know. You have uh, more than half of Reading's available labor is limited, has earned at least a bachelor's degree. It's very highly educated workforce. You have some public transit here and transit oriented development strategy. It's obviously one of the most physically attractive places in Massachusetts. I'll attest to that. You've got some good office space that might be available. You do have readily accessible, up-to-date lists of sites. A lot of this. Reading provides a development handbook to prospective developers. Very few communities do that. That's what we heard from you. You have citizen participation in the review process. Um, and uh, once in a while, your local leaders have come to try and rescue a project and make the community better understand why it for them. Uh, you have lots of wonderful cultural and recreational activities here. Um, your crime rate is very low. You have a home ownership rate is very high. But unfortunately, on the other hand, as we'll see, very expensive housing. And you have super schools. Right. Your local tax rates, um, you use a local meals tax, which helps pay for your local services. And you have a flat tax, residential and commercial at the same rate, which is better than some other Close to airports, you can get to Logan. Rail, um, you have commuter rail, proximity to universities and research. The you have a permitting ombudsman, your town manager plays a significant role in facilitating the 
permitting process and you expect to do more of that and you have a really beautiful website. Okay? But, uh. but, there's some weaknesses. Okay? You've already identified it. High municipal approvals, site plan reviews, zoning variances, and the appeals process take longer than other communities on average. And that turns out to be a really important one, as you'll see. Rents, um, your rents tend to be a little higher than other communities, not surprising for an affluent community like this. You have um, some parking issues that you have to deal with. Uh, you have, um, you, you need a more up-to-date economic development strategy. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, Cross-marketing, some communities are working very closely between their municipal leaders and their local chamber to market the town. The chamber is a better advertiser than the town manager or mayor in the cities. Um, quality of available space, you have a very, you're constrained in terms of site availability. Um, and continue. Um, you're developing a checklist of permitting requirements as part of your streamlining process, but you don't have that yet. Um, the state <coughs> offers all kinds of incentives, from investment tax credits, workforce credits, R&D credits. You can help your firms that are thinking about settling here take advantage of those. Some other communities are doing that. Um, local business incentives, you could use, and some communities are using TIFs, tax increment financing, particularly for some infrastructure. So forth. Okay? Housing again. Affordable housing, particularly for the incredible demographic shifts that are going to be happening in your community. Uh, we need to deal. Um, you could use a few more restaurants, uh, although I've never, uh, I've been in Green Street and sampled some of your great fare. Um, we could do a little bit more in helping firms with their workforce needs through training. Um, you probably, we heard, do not have a regular webmaster. Uh, although I found your website to be quite good. And we're going to need, in the region, uh, continued emphasis on improving our location <coughs> schools. Right. Um, you don't have freight service, it turns out that's not very important anymore. Trucking and airplanes aren't good. But now, in conclusion, what I did is this past year, I was actually on sabbatical. And most people think that means a professor takes a 12 month vacation. That is not true for me. I was actually working at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And so most of the days, I was just sitting around setting world interest rates. But when I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> when I wasn't setting world interest rates, which I never touched, I was working with a group called the Regional Community Outreach Department, uh, which has been working with communities across Massachusetts, many of the poorer communities, to try and help them develop. And I finally took all the data we had, Reading wasn't included at that time, and I tried to figure out <coughs> not what the location specialist told us was important, but empirically what was important. And so I got data, again, from those ES202s. I got the Reading data for, for each community. I said, OK, how well did communities do between 01 and 07, 2001 and 2007, in terms of the number of establishments and the amount of employment? And then between, at the time, 2007, and I think it was 2011. And here's what I found. I just did a thing that's called a correlation analysis. What factors of all the economic development self-assessment tool factors, the 220 that I got down to 26 measures, which of those 26 measures were most important, or I shouldn't say most important, most correlated with faster establishment growth in so I took now about 50 some communities, I think there were 50 at the time, and I did this. I got how fast their employment grew, how fast their establishments grew, the number of establishments. I took our 26 variables, I put them in a computer, I did some whiz bang stuff, and it turned out the most important factor that correlated with more rapid establishment growth was the kind of economic development marketing the community did. Those that turned cognitive maps around. Those that said, we're open for business, talk to us. We'd like to have you come to town. Actually did best. And that's part of the reason Lawrence did so well. And it's part of the reason that Chelsea has done so well. They've changed their image. The second, high municipal approvals. Again, I didn't make this up. 
This is just coming out of the data. This isn't even theory. This is just pure number crunching. High municipal approval. Parking, you need parking for employees, you need parking for customers, not surprising. Public transit turned out to be fairly important. Cross market, that's where, again, your businesses and your town work together turned out to be very important. Low traffic congestion was helpful. Fast track permitting, finding ways of getting permits through quickly with a constrained time horizon, even though you go through all the review process, you do it quickly. And finally, obviously, you need to have sites available. So those are the things that told us what were important. And then I matched them up with how well is Reading doing? Well, Reading has good public transit, commuter rail, low traffic congestion, and you have reasonably good site availability. Unfortunately, whoops, we went a little too fast. We got some news. That was intentional. I wondered why you wanted to operate. So, but you got some things to work on. Mm -hmm. And apparently, as I said, I'm superfluous. You figure this out on your own. Economic development marketing, you could do a better job of this. And over time, if you want to maintain your tax base and build it, that's someplace where you can put some more energy. And I have to tell you, I've been in all of these 50 communities. This is one of the most beautiful I know. This is a place. If I were a small business or a middle-sized business, I'd want to be. Um, professor, on that point, I there there, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm John. Okay. Uh, I would assume at this point there's a number of best practices that we could just mine out of those that have come before us. Absolutely. Where do we find them? From us. Or you can talk to Nadia, or you can talk to Cornette. But the kind of things that, that, that you do is, number one, is really having an attractive website. Because in the same way that we bring those temps in to go through those first, um, here's a site developer. You know, he's got a firm, the site specialist. The very first thing he does is he goes through websites. Just like you. They Google ready mass. And they look at the website and say, do I get information here that tells me this is a community that's interested in having an investment? And you don't need just ten pre-website, but something that speaks directly Some to the right. economics, the developments, the sites, right. the mechanisms. Clear idea about what the zoning process is. Clear idea of what the permitting process is. Clear idea of what development sites are available. Clear idea of what your workforce looks like. And so forth. And the more you put on it in an attractive way, the more likely you get through that first pass. We don't go in the discard pile. And now we can look at you. Uh, how, how, how do municipalities approach the uh, the marketing uh, through uh, paid consultants? No, or? not necessarily. Many are doing this in two ways. One is the website. The second is municipal leaders spend a lot in the communities that are successful spend a lot more time working with the chamber of commerce and having the chamber work along with them in marketing. The other thing that some communities have been doing is let's say you've got three firms that have settled in your town over the last 12 months. You actually have people go out and interview them, ask them what they liked about the community, what's working, what's not, and you find the communities are saying, we settled here and we love it. And you use that in your marketing, including even on your website. Testimonials. Testimonials, right? Because what sells business is other business. You can be the best mayor in the world and you say, you know, Detroit's a great place to sell. It's much more helpful to have a Detroit business leader say, you think it's a horrible place, it's actually great. So those are two things. The website catches your attention, and then you work at cross-marketing between the community and the business community to actually have a coherent marketing strategy. Some of the other things that communities have been doing is when a firm talks about getting there, they hear about it, and you don't, though in some communities they're now following up and asking, well, why did you come to live? Right? Why did you go to Bill Rare? And they said, well, we got cheap land, or we got it, it, it shows a real interest. So those are some things. We can, over the next few months, we can give you some other ideas. And we're learning them because just we talk from lots of communities and they're telling us what they're doing. Third is um, some improvement in parking might help. And um, this cross-marketing, which I was just talking about, I think you should consider doing. 
a little bit more of it. I don't know how closely Chamber works with you, but you can really put together something that's quite exciting. So that's what we found. And um, I'm, uh, I think the most important things to think about are ones you've been thinking about already. Reading has a lot of good things going for it, particularly the low traffic congestion, you have some available development sites, etc. But think about A, developing a comprehensive economic development plan, including some of the ideas I just threw out. B, improve the timeliness of zoning process, which you've been talking about most of the evening, and work with the business community to market ready as a good place to do business. That's what we found. And again, we don't live here. We just looked at your data. We didn't even fill out the data. You did. So we didn't change what you told us. What we did was craft the survey. What we did was compare you to other communities based on the same set of questions. And I'm just the messenger, superfluous